This morning I want to take us to Psalm chapter 107. I'm going to do an overview of the whole psalm, but I'm just going to do an overview. But I want to read just the opening two verses. Psalm chapter 107, where it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Let me preface that. You who are born again, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures for a year or so. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from trouble. Can you just bless the Lord with me? Can you just give the Lord a great amen for those beautiful words? Bless the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So this morning, what I want to share with those that are born again, is if you're born again, you've got to learn to say so. We, we mustn't be a bunch of quiet Christians. Man, that which has gotten you born again is good news. That which you have been saved from was a terrible, terrible and eternal consequence. We, we, we can't even wrap our minds around the gravity of what it was that we were saved from. But listen to me. Our redemption is not just about being saved from. Our redemption is also about what we've been saved to. You see, if you set somebody free, all that he is, is he's a free slave. But God didn't just come and set us to be free. God came so that we could be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. And we, He came so that He could do such a miraculous work within us that we would be transformed and conformed into the image of the darling of heaven, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ our Messiah. That is an amazing, miraculous work. And if that doesn't get you talking, I don't know what will. If that doesn't get you happy, I don't know what's going to get you dancing around. That is some good news. The reason why some Christians are not dancing and not happy and way too zoop, quiet about their salvation is because they've still not get, got a revelation of all that their salvation is. If you had a revelation, you'd be doing a lot more talking about it. Now, you know, the other day I was down at the shopping mall and I, I started chatting to a man and, and God bless him. I suppose he was sincere in his, old, in his own way, a little bit older than me, this man. And, and, and while we were talking about stuff, he, he, he made a statement. He said, well, I don't want to proclaim to be a great Christian or anything, and I thought to myself while I was talking, I thought, you know, brother, you look like a lovable, likable man. But that what you've just said is so pathetic. Come on, man. If you're a Christian, be bold in your Christianity. Let the redeemed of God say so. Let, let, let them. So many people are so proud of the horrible, stupid things that they hold to in this day. I mean, really, look at some of the things that some people commit their lives to. The causes, the practices, and the hobbies. They're not ashamed to speak about those things that they, that they hold to, that they've been, literally, that they've given their lives to. Come on, man. If you realize the things that we belong to, if you realize Him to whom we've been called, we should be ecstatic. We should be over the moon. We should be bubbling with joy to share it. I shared with that man, I said, well, I just need to say, I don't mean to be funny, but, but, but I say with all pride in Jesus Christ that I am a great Christian. And the reason why I'm a great Christian is not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done in me. Now let's talk. Now that we've set the ground straight, let's have our conversation about God. Now that we both know what we feel and what we hold to and what's truly important to us, now let's talk about Jesus. Well, the whole course of the conversation changed after that. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. When you exchange with people in the marketplace, whether they've been born again or whether they're not born again, say so. When you've got an opinion about Christ in a matter, don't be shy about it. Say so. Let people understand why it is and what the hope is in you. Now the Bible says speak the joy and uh, the truth in love. Uh, some people have been arrogant in their faith in saying so. I'm not talking about being that. I'm talking about winning over a heart with the joy of redemption. You've got the news of the joy of redemption in you and you can win somebody's heart over you. Uh, oh man, there's so little true joy in this world. People that are out of salvation don't have joy because there's a sense they understand that there's a part of their spirit man or their spirit man within them is dead, like I explained last time. There's a death within them. Some born-again Christians are not happy. They're also sad 
Because although they've been born again, they don't grasp the fullness of what it is that they've been born unto. And we know and we believe that we've been redeemed. The Word of God says so. You've been born again. You know that you've been redeemed. But what does it mean to be redeemed? Many of you already know that when it speaks about redemption, what they're talking about is purchasing somebody back. Somebody that was enslaved to something. Somebody comes with a redemption price and pays that redemption price in order to set at liberty, set free, or take over ownership of somebody else. Oh, brothers and sisters, when we were still lost and when we were still in our sin, let me tell you, you were possessed and you were owned. But you were owned not by God. You were owned. The Bible says you belong to the kingdom of darkness. But listen to me very carefully. The reason why you were belonged to the kingdom of darkness is not because the devil purchased you legitimately. It's because you fell in Adam. I've already spent enough time. By default, you were in Adam. And he took possession. And he started wreaking wrath in your life. He started wreaking a sadness and bitterness and negativity and hurt and lack in your life when jesus christ came to calvary two thousand years ago he paid a price for you that you could not pay for yourself the bible says clearly where jesus spoke and he said nobody takes my life from me of my own accord i lay it down but oh thank god for the good news where he says but i take it up again and because he lives we shall live forever and forever amen so jesus came to pay a price for us he did not pay the redemption price or give the redemption price to the devil. Oh no. The reason why we by default felt, fell into the devil's domain is because God took his hand of protection over us. We, we, we could not communicate with God because we had that part of our, of our being, the spirit man that was designed to communicate with God, perished within us that time that Adam fell. And every one of us born in Adam was born with a dead spirit. So there was nothing that was, so because we were soulish men, by default we fell. But listen to me, when D Jesus came to pay the price of redemption, he didn't pay the price of redemption to the devil. I've heard wonderful poems of how Jesus paid the redemption price to the devil. Heresy, heresy, heresy. God doesn't owe anything to the devil. Never. Jesus came and paid our redemption price to the Father. The Son came and took upon himself our sin so that he could liberate us and satisfy the justice of God. And he paid the redemption price to the Father. And by paying the redemption price to the Father, when our spirit man within us that was dead, when that spirit man is infused once again with the breath of life and comes to life again, now God can communicate with that spirit. Now God's hand of favor breathed into that spirit and we become redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What good news that now we have an open line of communication with Most High God. In fact, so pure, so beautiful, so free is our line of communication with the Most High God that He has encouraged us to call Him Father, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, my Lord and my Savior. As we get a little bit deeper this morning, I just want to share a couple of truths uh, of, of, that the psalmist shared with us this morning. Let me just show you quickly that these truths that the psalmist is sharing with us are based on two fundamental pivotal facts. It's good to have a basis for the things that you believe in. So many of us, the things that we believe in are snatched away from us or they crumble away because they don't have a good basis. Now, I'm about to share some truths from God's Word, but before I do that, let me share the foundation and the truths upon which this basis stands. Firstly, the psalmist tells us that God is good. Oh, brothers, sisters, if there's anybody here this morning that believes that God is good, could you please say so? Let me hear a yeah and amen. God is good. You see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. You'd never get a revelation that God is good just by reading about it in a book. Oh, no. You'd never get a revelation that God is good just by listening to somebody else saying that God is good. Although a testimony is a very powerful thing. 
If you want to get a true revelation of how truly good God is, you need to experience it for yourself. You need to get a first-hand lesson. This is not a correspondence course. This is not distance learning. You need to pitch up to class so that God can infuse some lessons. You need to get in touch with the personal encounter with Jesus. And you need to know that God is good. Oh, God is good. You see? The born again know that God is good, not just because of it's based on, an exper- uh, on experience. This is, don't confuse what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not saying that you know that God is good just because of some good experiences in God. No, in fact, it's the opposite. There are times where you get a revelation of the goodness of God through the most trying and difficult of experiences. There are times that though you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you know that he's good. Not because things are fuzzy and nice and flary and lighty around you. Not because things are, are all buzzy and cre- No, but because the Lord your God is with you. Never shall I leave you, never shall I forsake you, said our Lord and our God. There are times that you go through great difficulties, but it's through those times of difficulties that you experience and come to know that God is good. And the second foundation upon which these truths are based is that his steadfast love, oh, his steadfast love endures forever. It doesn't endure for a season. It, it's not yet today and gone tomorrow. It, it doesn't endure while you're being a good little Christian and getting full score marks in your doc, doctrinal classes. Even when you fall, God's in love endures for you. Even when you have hurt his heart, even when you have hurt God, even when you have grieved his spirit, his steadfast love endures for you. But praise be to God that even though you grieve his spirit, his faithfulness is going to bring you back. He's going to bring you back. He's going to bring you back. This morning, based on those two truths, I want to show you what it is that we have been redeemed from. Picking up on just a few as we do an overview of this whole chapter. Firstly, let me explain to you the good news, brothers and sisters, that you have been redeemed from trouble. Everybody goes through trouble, but you have been redeemed from trouble. Trouble comes knocking on everybody's door. There's not a human being in existence, whether you're saved or whether you're a believer. No matter what culture you belong to, no matter what your economic background is, your social background or your educational background, trouble comes knocking on everybody's door. Trouble comes in many different types of uh, shapes and forms. But there's one common purpose of trouble. It can come in the form of anxiety, It can come in a form of a lack of job. It can come in a form of business. It can come in a form of relationship. It can come in many forms, ill ill health. But the common cause of trouble coming into your life and the reason why it comes, the goal of trouble coming into your life, is to bring you to a place of worry and concern. It's to distance you. By exhaustion and by sorrow, it's to distance you from that place of joy and peace in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter what form the sorrow takes, it's got one common goal, to separate you from that place of peace and rest in Jesus Christ. Everybody has sorrow, but here's the good news for those who are born again. Oh, here's the good news for those that are born again. God has redeemed you from trouble, which means when trouble comes knocking on your door, you have got a legal right to say, Trouble! You've got no place here. Anxiety, fat your goed and trek. Worry, you don't have a right to put your talons and your claws into me. Trouble, in the name that is above every other name. Be gone. Doesn't mean that your trouble is going to evaporate overnight, but I'll tell you what it does mean. That the God our Father is going to set into order a series of events. And the next thing you look behind you, your trouble is a thing of the past. The next thing you look behind you, and you will be singing, Praise God for He is good, and His steadfast love endures forever. This is the thing. When trouble comes knocking on your door, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Don't be quiet. There must be a confession upon your lips. 
When the enemy lies by showing you trouble, you need to change those gears and you need to start speaking the truth of God. Start speaking those scriptures, quoting the promises upon which you live. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. Here's my question to you. Statement and then a question. See, see like I said, if this word is going to be life to you, then first you need to be alive in Christ Jesus. You need to be born again. You, you, you can be dead in your trespasses. And, and praise God, I, I want to tell you that, that by His grace, some unbelievers can pick up the word and God wanting to just arrest their souls with his love, will speak through and unto salvation. But I'm saying those deeper truths of God, those are there for those that are spiritually born. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And there are things that the unregenerate just cannot get out of God's word. But the redeemed, oh, let the redeemed say so. When trouble comes knocking on your door, what do you say? What you say will say a lot about you. When trouble comes knocking on your door, what is the confession of your lips? Oh, well, there's God. He's let me down again. No, his steadfast love endures forever. This may be a tough situation, but I've gone through tougher before and he has redeemed me. Oh, this may hurt, but I want to tell you, he's promised me never, no, never, no, never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Don't let unredeemed confessions come out of redeemed lips. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You see, I, I serve a God who in his word has promised me that the Lord God knows how to rescue the righteous from troubles. It's not a God that is going to prevent you from ever seeing troubles. You would never have a testimony if you'd never gone through a test. You need to go through the test. But God will be with you because he's building into you a testimony. And oh, when you get to the other side, you will know that you have victory over the test. You will know yourself better. But more than that, you will know your heavenly father better. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now, in this case, what the psalmist was speaking about was he was speaking about trouble that came in the form of wandering. Wandering. Now, I'm not talking about pondering. I'm not talking about, hmm, I wonder. I I'm talking about that inability to settle down. You move from one place to another place and to another place. And do you know any wanderers in your life? Some marriages have been broken, shattered to pieces because the man has not known how to settle down. Or the woman has found other excitement in her life. A husband and her children are not enough. She wonders. Some people cannot find a job and be satisfied in a job. They wander from job to job. Some people cannot find satisfaction in a church. They'll wander from church to church. Wander from friendship to friendship, from relationship. Thank God for those stable people, man. Thank God for those people that have got stickability. I want to tell you that stickability is a sign of God's grace upon somebody. Listen to me very carefully. When we speak about wandering in the Bible, there's different forms of wandering. The one form of wandering on somebody is a direct curse from God. You'll remember that when Cain murdered his brother Abel, when God cursed him, he threw him out of the garden or threw him out of the place where he was settling. Adam and Eve thrown out of the garden. But Cain was thrown out of the presence of Adam and Eve even. And said, you shall be a wanderer upon the earth. That's a curse of God. And I can see that curse working in the lives of many people. Not in Christians. Christians are redeemed of the curse. We heard about that this morning. But I see the curse of wandering just Never able to settle down. Never able to build those friendships, build those relationships, spend that time. And oh, how empty those people are because you're, you're denied those richer relationships, those, those richer lessons that come with stickability. There's another form of wandering that is not a curse. There's a form of wandering where we read about in the Old Testament when, when God set his people free. 
And God set His people free from Egypt. After they were liberated, after they crossed the Red Sea, they went into a desert place, and a desert place of wandering. The Bible says they wandered for 40 years. Now that was not as a result of a curse, that was a result of a punishment. They could have gone into the promised land after 11, year, after 11 days of marching. But it took them 40 years because when God said go in, they said, uh-uh, ah, ah, the enemy is too big. God said, fine, go wander for 40 years. Now, some people, some Christians are in a place of wandering because of disobedience. I'll tell you why. They haven't had a full revelation of what it means to be redeemed. And so they still wander from this place and wander to that place. And I wonder if this teaching is right. And I wonder if that teaching is right. And I wonder if I can submit to this pastor or this eldership team or this church. And I, I, There's just no stability. There's that sense of wandering all the time. You know, they need to get a revelation of what it means to be redeemed. Because God has no intention for His Christians to stay in the wilderness forever. God wants you to cross over into the promised land. I believe some people need to get a revelation. Born again, sons and daughters of God. You've been in a land of wandering for too long. You've crossed the one river, the Red Sea. Now there's the Jordan River. You need to cross the Jordan River to get into your promised land. Wandering. Wandering. God has promised those that wander. And the Bible says that he led them by a straight way until they reached a city. Oh, until, let me tell you about your city. His name is Jesus. See, because in John chapter 3, listen, here is the difference between wandering and somebody born of the Spirit. The Bible says, or Jesus said in John chapter 3, you will remember that Jesus says, those that are born of the Spirit are like the wind. It blows wherever it is. Nobody knows where it comes from. And nobody knows where it's going. And on first examination, I would think that that looks like wandering to me. Blowing here and blowing there. No, 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 no. Here's the difference. The difference between blowed, blown by the Spirit and wandering in the desert. It's when you're blown by the Spirit, you're in Christ Jesus. You're in your city. You are rooted in Him. And you're not running to and fro because you're confused. You're going to and fro. You're blowing to and fro because you've been led by the Holy Spirit. You understand the difference? Let those who are redeemed from wandering say so. If there's any mothers and fathers with wandering sons and daughters, today I declare to you in the name of Jesus, you have the authority to speak into their lives. You have the authority to tell them, settle down. Settle down. There's a new land waiting for you. We are redeemed from a longing soul. We are redeemed from a... Now closely related to a wandering spirit is a longing soul. A longing soul here is described as a soul that is hungry and sits in darkness. Listen to me now. I spoke about the difference between the spirit and the soul. I, I told you earlier that the soul is one that is led. It is, it, it is not a follower. I mean, it's not a leader. It's a follower. It will either be led by the spirit of this world or it will be led by the spirit of, this God, of our God, the soul. And, and the soul in so many people is sad. It is sorrowful. It is in a dark place. It is hurt. Let me tell you, when you interact with some people, they're nasty with you or they're cruel with you, get a revelation of how very sad their soul is. This is why the Word uh, of God speaks to us about blessing those that curse us. We do it with great wisdom, and we do it according to God's Word. It doesn't mean we run around and say, Oh, please be nasty to me so I can bless you. That's not what the Word is saying. But it's saying that you take cognizance of the fact that their soul is very broken. And they might have a spirit that is alive within them, or they have a spirit that is still dormant. They are either born again or they're not, but their soul is broken. It gives you great advantage in the spiritual arena when you can pray over somebody's soul. Pray over that person's soul. That's why God has brought you into that situation. A soul that is hungry and sits in darkness. You know, if you've been in darkness for a while, you get disorientated. You get disorientated. I have... Uh, there's something about the power of darkness. Not all darkness is bad. 
The Bible speaks in a sense of God's glory as being thick darkness. Not all darkness. Is, there's something beautiful about darkness too. So what we have a difference here is the redeemed that face darkness and the unredeemed that face darkness. To the one it is a place of beauty and meditation. For the other it is a place of hunger and confusion. Now I've been in this church during the daytime. I want to tell you there have been times that I've come to this church at night. Nobody here. Every light switched off. Oh, you feel a different kind of presence in this place. When you're all alone and it's dark. When your, mind, your eyes can't be wandering all over the place. You just allow yourself to be quietened in the presence of God and in his darkness. And he meets with you in a beautiful way. This is the power of the redemption of dark, darkness. He's going to take your darkness, which is a place of hunger and horror and fear and confusion, and he's going to turn it into a place of beauty and meditation and connection with him. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We are redeemed, brothers and sisters, from foolishness and folly. I, I, I try to be as kind as I can when I say this. Oh, this world is full of fools. Oh boy, this world is full of fools. And, I, and I'm, I'm yet to say, I'm not immune myself. I have many foolish ways about me. But oh, thank God that at least I've allowed him to start working on me for my foolishness. I, I, I see that people run after foolish things. People allow foolish things to unsettle them and unnerve them. People spend their time and their money on foolish things. A little while ago, uh, uh, Brett and I were just sharing and a young mother that had a young child just given birth and you know, still struggling to get things right with the young father, struggling to get things right with the house and their home. Father takes the money and goes and blows it on a motorbike for himself. I say, no! When you were a child, you could buy childish things. Now that you're a man, you need to spend your money on nappies. And spend your money on motorcycles. And some people can be old and they're spending their money on golf sticks. And spending their money on sporting equipment. Spending their time watching DSTV and spending, instead of spending their time in church. Oh, people run after foolish things. Thanks be to God that God has redeemed us from our foolish ways. Because you get a revelation that time is short. Get a revelation that Jesus Christ is coming any time now. There's no time to be messing around with foolish things. Leave the foolish things to the fools. But let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let them take up the banner of wisdom. Let them take up the banner of light. Let the wisdom of God be seen in them by the way that they live, which is so different to the ways of the things of this world. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Oh, and we are redeemed from the raging waves. I'm going to close down with this thought. Obviously so much more that I could speak about. I, I remember years ago, some friends and I decided to go deep sea fishing. Now, totally inexperienced. You see, I was still way more of a fool then than I am now. And so we decided to go and get a rubber duck and we were now going to go deep sea fishing on this rubber duck. And when we, when we launched, the sea was rough enough as it was. I still remember they said to me I was going to be the nose boy. I didn't even know what the nose boy was. Let me explain to you the job of a nose boy. It takes a rocket scientist to do that job. The nose boy is basically a weight. It's, it's your job to sit right on the tip of the nose of the rubber duck. So if it hits a wave, your job is to stop it from flip, flipping over and you've got to hit it that way. Well, as we hit the first wave, it went parallel. We were launching into orbit. And, and, and this rubber duck came down. My hands were on the sides. I was thinking I was holding tight. And as the rubber duck hit the waves, my hands went like this. And then I became a nose boy for a different reason because my nose hit the rubber duck. 
and I was bleeding throughout the rest of the fishing trip. I hurt myself. Then we get out into the, into the far distance, way too far. I mean, we had a fish finder, and you saw little schools on, this, on the screen of the fish finder, the little schools of the fish swimming. Every now and again, you'd see a big manier coming underneath the ship, or underneath the rubber boat, duck. We were out there for a long time. All of us became very generous because we all donated our breakfast to the ocean that day. Because the waves of the sea were up and down and up. Then you could see the land. Then you couldn't see the land. Then you could see the land. Then you couldn't. Look what the psalmist says over here. They mounted up to the heavens and they went down to the depth. Went up to the heavens. And down to the depths. Isn't it a sad thing when some of us live our spiritual lives or our lives like that? The, the, the wind of every doctrine comes along and upsets us. And this one preaches that and in everything we've believed before we think, oh, is it true, isn't it true? We're not solid. Or, 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 or the, a politician stands up and makes a statement and then all of a sudden we're up and we're down. Basically, what this Psalm 107 is telling us is that if you're redeemed, if you're born again, you're not an up and down person. You're a stable man. You're mature in your ways. You're mature in the ways that you see situations of this, of this world. You're mature in your ways that, that, you, that you face your attacks and that you face your troubles. You're mature in your ways that you deal with difficult people. You're mature in your ways that you deal with bad news or a bad report. You don't run off here and wander there. You don't, you're not up here one day and down the next day. Your confession is always so. So the enemy comes and tells you, your bank, report is, your, your, your bank balance is not good. And you say, so? God is my provider. The enemy comes and says, well, nothing's really changed in your medical condition, you say. So, God is my healer. Well, the enemy comes and says, everything looks hopeless, man. There's just no way out. You're stuck. So, the Lord is my shepherd. He shall lead. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Don't be quiet. When you were born again, not only was your spiritual man breathed new life. Did he not receive? He received new life breathed into him. But when you were born again, your, your tongue was set free. No longer do you make the confessions of this world, but now you say, So, 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 I will confess God into every situation that comes my way. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let me just close with a few more. Let the redeemed. Let the redeemed thank the Lord for his steadfast love and for his wondrous works. If you've received his steadfast love and wondrous works, can I hear a so? Let the redeemed of the Lord offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. Can I get a so? Let the redeemed tell of his deeds. In songs of joy. Can I get a so? Let the redeemed extol him in the congregation of the people. Can I get a so? Let the redeemed praise him in the assembly of the elders. Can I get a so? And then get this. Let the redeemed see it and be glad. Let the redeemed see it. I want to speak over you that you're about to see the goodness of God revealed in your life. His steadfast love and goodness. He's going to take your so to a whole new level. We're going to become so Christians. He's going to take your so to a whole new level. God is about to set free in your life a manifestation. You see, you've been speaking about it, but you haven't seen it. You're about to see it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And, and here's, my, here's my exhortation to you. In anticipation of seeing it, you need to sow your sows everywhere you go. Sow your sow everywhere you go. Sow it in, ex in ex anticipation 
and an expectation of that breakthrough that you know is coming your way. Of that revelation that God is saying, you're about to see it. You've spoken it. You've sown it. You've gone so, so, so. It's gonna come your way. You're about to see it. You're about to see it. This morning, I leave you with this scripture. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. You see, don't, don't be dismissive. You need to be attentive. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things and, and let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. As I dismiss you, beloved brothers and sisters, I do so under the presence and with the knowledge, and our focal hairs, our focal point, the steadfast love of the Lord. God bless you. God keep you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. What a joy it is, God, to be redeemed. This is not something that we could have done in our own strength. Thank you, God, for sending a Savior unto us. Thank you, God, for sending a Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for redeeming us. So that now we can stand in the congregation of the redeemed. And here's the responsibility of those that are born again. Here's the responsibility of those that are redeemed. That we say so. We've got something to say. We have a gospel message. We are the bearers, the custodians, and the guardians of the good news. Oh God, let us say so. Would you let us this week go into our highways and byways, into our homes, into our places of work, into our, our social spheres, into our places of sport. God, wherever we may go, let us go as those that are prepared to say so. Give us an opportunity to say so. To whomever we speak, let us glorify you with the confession of our mouths. For I ask this in that name which is above every other name, Jesus our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen.